Welcome to Modern Latin America in 15 Minutes. My name is Dr. Kim Richardson and today I want to discuss Guatemala. But what I mean uh, by discussing Guatemala is that in 1945-ish, Latin Americans are going to realize that there are no, there's no substantial change. And those that said they're going to reform the system failed. So they're going to turn to revolution. Guatemala is the first great example of revolution that I want to discuss. Now, going back a little bit in 1931, uh, 1930, 31, 32, Latin Americans turned to dictatorship, blaming the democracy for causing the Great Depression. Here, the dictator of, of uh, Guatemala is going to be forced to resign in 1944. See, so because when now that we're fighting to make the world safe for democracy, how can we have a dictatorship? It doesn't make sense. By now, there's about 3 million people living in Guatemala. Most of them, three-fourths of them, were Ladinos. Ladinos are, is another term that's the same thing as mestizos. That means mixed race. Uh, did I say that right? 75% Indians, 25% Ladinos. That's what I meant to say. They are an export-oriented economy. That means mostly they survive off of the export of bananas and coffee. Well, that means that it's going to be right for economic nationalists. Populists, perhaps, or maybe just reformers. In 1944, Juan José Arevalo, the candidate of the Renovation Party was elected after the overthrow of the dictator. So he gets to be elected, and you know he wants to have reform. He had the support of the workers, uh, and he decided the first thing he's going to do is say, listen, if you don't want to work, you don't have to work, right? We're not going to have slave labor, or in this case, forced labor that the dictatorship had instituted or, or forced on his people. He also did a lot of reformist measures. Social Security. It sounds so radical, but the United States did it too. Labor Code. Unfortunately, uh, for uh, in American eyes, it led to unionization, and Americans do not like unions as a whole. 1947, uh, Industrial Development Law to encourage industrialization. So he was a reformer. Uh, the height of this is going to be the Constitution of 1945. In an attempt to be economically independent, the Constitution stated the larger states were illegal. So, I have this in picture right here, uh, Rigoberta Menchu, uh, but she's holding in 1980 the Vicente Menchu uh, little cross, which was her father, right? And so, this is a Maya family that they want to have land, but they didn't have land. But now that you have this land reform measures, the larger states are going to lose their land and it's going to be given to the peasants. As such, the central government had the power to confiscate the land and redistribute it to whoever needed it, like the indigenous peoples of Guatemala. This is, as you can imagine, this constitution of 1945 based on the Mexican constitution of 1917. Remember, land reform for both. All of these revolutions are going to base their revolutions and the new constitutions on that of the Mexican Revolution. That is why we place so much emphasis on that revolution. Well, in 1950, after this uh, reformist period, Colonel Jacobo Arbenz won the presidency, also RN candidate. His goal is, as he stated, to reduce neocolonial dependency. He doesn't want, uh, he's an economic nationalist like his predecessor. Oh, I even put that down there. He's an economic nationalist, like his predecessor. He states, Our government proposes to begin the march toward the economic development of Guatemala and proposes three fundamental objectives. To convert our country from a dependent nation with a semi-colonial economy to an economically independent country. To convert Guatemala from a backward country with a predominantly feudal economy into a modern capitalist state and to make this transformation in a way that will raise the standard of living of the great mass of our people to the highest level. So as such, he passes the Agrarian Reform Law of 1952. If there is land in which over 
220 acres of which, land that has 220 acres, and less than two-thirds was being cultivated, the government could expropriate it and give it to whoever was in need of land. That's what he does. In total, 1.5 million acres of land is going to be uh, expropriated and redistributed to over 100,000 families that were in need. Well, that's great for the masses, is it not? But what about if the major exporters of bananas coffee, who own the banana and coffee, bananas especially, companies? That is the United Fruit Company. And this is their old headquarters in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Now they're called Chiquita Banana, but it was the United Fruit Company or the Fruitery, Frutaria. Well, they had lots of land. Uh, and uh, the land, they didn't use it all at a time because it takes bananas very good for you. And banana takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So they would leave the land in reserve, either to become, uh, to getting more nutrients put back in the soil after leaching it out, or else just in reserve, just in case there's going to be a hurricane or something and you need the land. So they had a lot of land that wasn't being used. 413,573 acres of land was deemed to be unused. So they expropriated it. They took it away. Well, what are you going to uh, do in uh, response to that? Well, I mean, if you're going to take somebody's land away from them, it's called nationalization, nationalizing it, and then you're going to pay them the value of the land. You take their tax records and you say, you have been paying taxes on your declared value, so that's what, based on what you say it's worth, we're going to give you that much money. And, of course, people cheat on their taxes all the time, so they're going to be especially upset that uh, the Guatemalan government is undervaluing the land and giving them much less money. Of course, they're upset that they're taking the land in the first place. All right, so how much do you pay for it? You look at their tax records. Well, it just so happens that the CIA director of the United States was Alan Dulles. He used to be the president of the United Fruit Company, the Secretary of State in the United States at this time was John Foster Dulles. He also had been a vital in the creation of the United Fruit Company. They both therefore stand to lose their pants if they, or their shirts I guess you should say, uh, uh, if this is expropriated. The goal is to reduce dependency on the United Fruit Company. So for example they announce plans to build a highway from Guatemala City to the coast. Wait a second, if the United Fruit Company had a railroad and monopolized transportation, that means that they're going to lose a lot of money there as well. Right? You're not expropriating, in this case, the railroad, but you are, you know, breaking the monopoly, breaking the back of the monopoly. Uh-oh, that's not good. So, this is the creation of international, uh, the, the, the proposal to create a new highway. And as you can see here, the United Fruit Company owned most of the transportation in Central America with this uh, uh, International Railways of Central America. Well, the United States decided that we do not like the government of Guatemala and we start plans to overthrow the government. The United States, I mean the United States, Guatemala sees that this is happening and they decide that what they need is to fight back. They need more arms and weapons and everything so that when their government is threatened they can defend themselves. They offer to buy it from the United States. The United States trying to overthrow the government by ourselves say uh, no we're not going to give it to you. So they buy it from the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Warsaw Pact, right? So arms shipments from Poland arrives in Guatemala in May of 1954. Why is this important? Because if we are going to protect our twin pursuits of trade, bananas, and security, communism, it appears that we have a big problem. Now, President Eisenhower just established a policy of covert uh, diplomacy in the sense that he's going to overthrow Iran, the government of Iran, covertly, and over nationalization as well. And it worked. It was successful. Of course, if you fast forward ahead, it's not going to be successful permanently, but at the time it was. So why not do it once again in Guatemala? So they planned an overthrow, and in June of 1954, they had the Colonel Castillo Armas invasion. This guy right here is going to be asked to be the leader of the overthrow and then the leader of the new government. Uh, if you don't uh, 
if you look at the records from the CIA that have been released, I think it's very indicative of what's going on there. In August 1953, the Operations Coordinating Board directed the CIA to assume responsibility for operations against the Arbenz regime. It goes on to discuss paramilitary operations, air operations, and in the end, Arbenz is overthrown by President, uh, well, then would be President Castillo Armas. Now, uh, President Nixon, right, he is going to be this big push for the fight against communism, and he was the vice president. President Castillo Armas' objective, he says, to do more for the people in two years than the communists were able to do in ten years is important. This is the first instance in history where a communist government has been replaced by a free one. The whole world is watching to see which does a better job. All right, then, which one is going to do a better job? The reality is that this is going to be called the reversal of land reform. You had confiscated land and give it to the peasants. Now you say, peasants, give it back. And it's kind of like if you ever have a baby and you give them a sucker and then you say, give me that sucker back, they're going to be very mad and they're going to scream very loudly. That is what happened here. Uh, a great movie to watch about this documentary is uh, When the Mountains Tremble. Tremble starring, of course, uh, it's a documentary, uh, Rigoberta Menchu. Now, in her, this case, this is an Indian woman, and a uh, uh, Maya Indian woman, and her father wanted to retain lands. He's going to be killed. His mo her mother wanted to uh, fight for, to keep the lands. She was killed. Her brother, he was killed. Her sister, he disappeared. She disappeared, I mean. She, as the last one remaining, decided that she was going to have to get out of Dodge, so she fled and wrote her memoirs. The book is called I Rigoberta Menchu. It's a great book. Now, I know a lot of people have been arguing that, you know, especially since she's been running for president, that this never happened to her, none of this stuff. It may or may not have happened to her, but it happened in, uh, uh, in Guatemala. So, the result, therefore, is a civil war. As many of these people, they don't want to lose their land. Over 100,000 people are going to be killed. Some people call this a genocide. I'm not sure it's a genocide, because genocide targets one group of people. This targeted every peasant, whether they are Indians or not. But it could be considered a genocide. Here's a great uh, couple of quotes out of a book. Uh, the name of the book is uh, Open Veins of Latin America, right? Our bed says agrarian reform was blown to smithereens when Castillo Armas's Armas fulfilled his mission of returning the land to United Fruit and other expropriated landlords. Indiscriminate repression formed a part of the military search and destroy campaign against guerrilla movement movements. Under the newly adopted code, members of the security forces were not held responsible for homicides, and police in any communiques were accepted as full proof by the courts. Plantation owners and managers have the legal status of local authorities with the right to carry arms and form punitive squads. The systematic butchery set no teletypes humming, no news hungry reporters flew to Guatemala, nor was any reproving voice heard. The world turned its back while Guatemala underwent a long St. Bartholomew's night. The violence did not stop after that. It has been a way of life in Guatemala ever since the period of humiliation and fury begun in 1954. Corpses, although not quite so many, continued to turn up in rivers and on roadsides, their featureless faces too disfigured by torture to be identified. The slaughter that is greater but more hidden, the daily genocide of poverty also continues. In 1968, another expelled priest, Father Blasi Bonpan, reported on the Sikh Society in the Washington Post, of the 70,000 people who die each year in Guatemala, 30,000 are children. The infant mortality rate in Guatemala is 40 times higher than in the United States. I'm not sure how many people really died in the civil war that resulted from the overthrow of Arbenz in 1954. At least 100,000. Nonetheless, this is the first uh, major attempt after the Mexican-American War, that is. I mean, no, I mean, after the Mexican Revolution, that is, to institute revolution, significant change. And it fails miserably with the inclusion, the participation of the U.S. CIA and the overthrowing of the government, which results in this great, devastating civil war.